Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am Game Master Bloodworth, and as you can see by the graphics, uh, today's video, I am going to begin my deep dive into the Majestic Fantasy RPG by Robert S. Conley. Uh, really looking forward to doing this as I am playing in uh, one of Robert's games in the upcoming uh, convention I'm attending, ShireCon which is December 27th and 28th, and uh, really looking forward to it. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to jump right into this. And today I'm going to focus on the tributes, and specifically I'm going to be looking for differences from the, um, from the original D&D that, um, that this is kind of based off of. Now this game uh, system is uh, is derived from OD and D or Dungeons and Dragons 1974 uh, variant of Dungeons and Dragons. So, uh, but there's also going to be some modernization thrown in, uh, and modernization going all the way back to uh, probably D and D BX and and of course moving forward as well. Now, this game system is fully compatible with. Uh, with Swords and Wizardry, uh, which is another really great OSR uh, game system um, created originally by Matt Finch and worked on by many, many others since then. So uh, without further ado, let's jump right into attributes. And I will zoom in on this. So as you can see, uh, and I do have the book. I will show the, the hardcover <coughs> that I picked up as well, but roughly 203 pages. And we're going to go right into attributes. Um, the forward here is very interesting, and um, it kind of shows you where the system goes from. And, and so I'm just going to jump right here to say this system is not a clone. I wrote the Majestic System in the third paragraph, by the way. I wrote the Majestic Fantasy Rules to detail the modifications I made to the original rules that reflect the reality of the setting I have been using for 35 years. Since the first appearance, I have continued to run campaigns in the same setting. Now, a decade later, I have more material to present, enough to warrant making the rules stand as their own system. <clears throat> what makes this system unique? A central feature of my campaigns is allowing the players to trash the setting by making their mark. Sometimes they only impact a single locale, other times they impact entire regions. Because of this, what characters do outside of adventuring is important. To support this, I create an ability system to handle some of the many things players may attempt to do outside of combat or magic. Because my campaigns involve adventures uh, resulting from cultural, religious, and political clashes, a list of common NPCs is included, and the concept of character races has been expanded into character backgrounds. I continue to use the fantasy medieval setting of the original game as the foundation of the myth, um, majestic fantasy realms. The material herein should be useful in campaigns using similar settings. In addition, I still use many of the same mechanics and details of swords and wizardry. So this book also functions as a swords and wizardry supplement. Creating characters, so this is a um, so this is a, a summary of the whole um, listing. So I would just jump through certain portions portions of this right now. You're rolling three d six six times. You're looking at the class uh, the character class summary and picking out the character class that interests you. Arrange the six rolls accordingly. It is recommended that. The highest role be placed in the character class's prime requisite. 
Dexterity will improve armor class. Constitution will improve hit points. Charisma improves your character's relations with NBCs of the setting and increase the number of loyal henchmen you can have. Rogue classes like the Burglar have bonuses to distribute among different abilities. Abilities are affected by different attributes, so look at the Rogue class abilities as a guide to arrange your roles among your character's attributes. Look at the character background summary and pick out the background that you want to play. Keep in mind that human backgrounds get a 10% to 15% bonus to their earned experience in, in addition to their prime requisite bonus. <clears throat> also keep in mind that backgrounds come with complications when dealing with various cultures. Modify your attributes according to the background. Record your attribute modifiers, your background abilities, and your class abilities. Allocate your class's ability bonuses Roll 3d6 plus charisma bonus and multiply by a d100 um, to equal um, a 100d, I'm sorry, 100d, d equals silver. So multiply by 100 silver. First level characters start with a maximum hit points. Pull out the short equipment list and so on and so forth, right? So a lot of modifiers and things to consider are going to go along with the attribute scores. So let's go into attributes. The basic attributes of a character are strength, their muscle and power, dexterity, their quickness and coordination, constitution, general health and hardiness, intelligence, education and reasoning, wisdom, common sense, and charisma, leadership. Human character attributes are rated from 3 to 18, with an average of 10. Rolling attributes. To roll the attributes, a new character rolls 3d6 six times, and arrange accordingly. So arrange as you wish. Attributes modify ability and combat rolls after assigning your attribute. Look at the modifier on the table, uh, the following chart. A score of 10 is average for human characters, right? So you're going to go anywhere from a, this is rollable, a minus 2 to as high as a plus 3. All right, so a 3, 4, or 5 is a minus 2. A 6, 7, 8 is a minus 1. A 9, 10, and 11 is a plus 0. 12, 13, 14, a plus 1. 16, 17, 18, plus 2. And 18 is plus 3. You're not going to get to a 19 or 20 unless you have some kind of modifiers. Um, so that gives you a range of either minus 2 up to a maximum of plus 3 on initial character creation, minus any other attribute modifiers. Prime requisite. Each of the four main classes, fighting men, clerics, magic users, and rogues, have an associated prime requisite. A score of 13 or better will give the character a 5% bonus to all experience. So clerics have wisdom, fighting men have strength, magic user has intelligence, and rogue has dexterity. I really like the fact that he is still using fighting men uh, in this uh, because that truly is a real um, throwback to an homage to D&D &D 1974. Strength, you get your standard modifiers that you would expect, right? So, um, modify saving throws involving danger that can be uh, avoided by using muscle power. Modifies the following abilities, athletics and climbing. Modifies the chance to hit in melee in combat. Modifies the weapon damage to uh, in combat as well. Modifies how much weight the character can carry. It is the prime requisite of fighting men, and so on and so forth. <coughs> it gives you the carrying, uh, the weight carried. So an 18 uh, could carry um, 100 pounds, a maximum of 200 pounds. There's probably no limitation on um, abilities, movement, or, or whatnot at 100 pounds. But once you get to your maximum capacity... Uh, you probably will have some slowdowns. We'll see how that comes to play a little bit later on. 
see the athletic ability to determine the maximum a character can lift. All right, so there's a difference between lifting and carrying. That's great to see. Dexterity, modifies saving throw involving danger that can be avoided due to a character's quickness or coordination. Modifies the abilities climbing, ledger, uh, ledger main, and stealth. Modifies the chance to hit with missile combat. Modifies the character's initiative rolls. Modifies the character's armor class. If the primary requisite of a rogue gains 5% to all earned experience if the score is 13 or better. Constitution represents the health, the hardiness, modifies saving throws uh, involving danger that can be avoided due to a character's health or hardiness, modifies the following ability, survival, modifies the number of hit points rolled as a result of gaining new hit dies when the character levels up. Intelligence. Now, here's a little difference that I really, really do like. Um, it's something I do in my own game as well. <clears throat> Intelligence represents the general education and reasoning ability of the character. It is the prime requisite of magic users and has the following effects. It modifies saving throw involving danger that can be avoided due to a character's education or reasoning ability. Modifies the following abilities. Accounting, eavesdropping, herb lore, history, mathematics, natural, philo uh, natural philosophy, physician, research, strategy, and tomatography, uh, tomatology, sorry, tomatology. Limits the, the maximum spell level a magic user can learn. All right, so obviously um, the maximum level you can earn, and I'll go through the chart later, is based on your intelligence score. Magic users gaining plus 5% to all earned experience if the score is a 13 or higher. So let's say you have an average intelligence, right? So a 10. Uh, your maximum level of spell casting is set at, um, is set at a 5. Now let's say you're a little bit better. You're a little bit more, um, more intelligent. Let's say you're pushing a 13 to 14, your maximum level is now a 7. A 15 to 16 is 8. A 17 and 18 is 9. All right. So what I really like about this is that it ties intelligence and the quote-unquote bonuses of higher intelligence to the maximum spell limit that you can have. Um, I like that better than the intelligence modifier of plus 1, 2, 3 you know, um, giving you additional languages uh, I, I, and without any impact on spell casting. So I do like the fact that this ties a higher intelligence to a higher ability to actually uh, access higher level arcane spells. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Wisdom represents the common sense and willpower of a character, modifies saving throws, uh, involving danger that can be avoided by common sense or willpower modifies the following ability. Perception. A wisdom score of 13 or better allows a cleric to have one extra first level spell. All right. Um, it is the primary requisite for clerics granting 13 to, um, to all experience gained uh, if it's a... So... Um, so with a wisdom of 13 or more, the character gains a, a one extra first level spell. I personally would expand that beyond that um, by saying that with a, uh, if we go to here, so a 13 is a plus one, at a 15, uh, plus one first level spell, with a 15, 16, or 17, I would add a plus two spell, uh, a second level spell. So... They have one for first, one for an extra second level spell with a 15, 16, or 17. So they'd have both. And then with an 18, they would have one extra third level spell. Um, so I would, I would carry over that concept here to make it a little bit more powerful uh, for a cleric, giving them, that, you know, giving them that extra bonus for having such a high wisdom. Charisma 
represents the leadership ability and personal rapport of the character. It has the following effects. Modify saving, uh, saves involving danger that can be avoided by using a character's leadership ability or personal rapport. Modifies the following uh, abilities. Uh, intimidation and locution. Sets the maximum number of loyal henchmen the character can effectively command. Uh, so the average would be able to command up to five henchmen. That's with a charisma of 10 and so on. It increases above that. Other attributes are uh, armor class. This system uses ascending armor class, right? So everyone starts with a base armor class of zero, uh, 10, I'm sorry, with a base armor class of 10, which means the attacker will need to roll a 10 or better on a d20 in order to hit the character uh, for damage. This can be modified upwards by wearing armor or having a high dexterity attribute and so on. So this uses a more modern ascending armor class system rather than the descending armor class that was previous. Our hit points represent the experience and uh, resistances to physical injury. When a character is brought to zero hit points or lower, they fall prone and are unconscious. A character will die instantly if they are brought to minus three hit points or lower. This limit is lowered by three points per level until it is equal to negative of the ca character's constitution score. For example, if Zephyrus Hammerguard has a 14 constitution, he will be able to take up to minus 14 hit points of damage once he becomes fifth level. At level two, he can take up to minus six hit points of damage at um, minus nine at level three, minus 12 at level four, and minus 14 equal to his constitution score at level five. All right, so uh, as he is going higher in level with that kind of a constitution, he gains more, <coughs> excuse me, he gains more survivability. Um, I like that system. That's, you know, again, it's something that I haven't seen before. So I kind of like that system. I use something a little bit different uh, in, in my own games and, and certainly with my own AD&D first edition game where um, your minuses are going to subtract from your constitution and, um, you know, negative hit points will subtract from your constitution. And that's the system shock check that you have to make in order to survive that particular wound. And uh, when you're bleeding and you're losing one, one, hit, uh, one hit point again, each round you have to make a new system shock check to see if you survive that continuously bleeding out at, yet again, another lower constitution. So I kind of have it going to that point where it's becoming progressively harder to survive negative hit points. Um, as you're getting lower and lower in the negative hit points. And then if you're brought to negative nine from a, um, you know, from a head injury, you're dead. Uh, uh, but any other kind of injury, you could possibly survive. But it's most likely going to be a career-ending injury anyway. So I kind of use the AD&D first edition rules, um, which is m more nuanced than this. Movement uh, is based on race. I'm not going to get into that. And character classes, I will save for the next time. So you can see here that the, the system has some differences. Uh, it's certainly taking, uh, you know, quite a bit from D&D &D 1974. And you'll see that even further in the character classes and the, um, you know, and, and whatnot, and the character racial uh, and species uh, assignments that you can place, you know, put on your character as well. Um, but there are some modern mechanics in here, you know, one being the ascending armor class, you know, and then it has some unique things, which are, as he, you know, accurately points out, as Robert Connolly accurately points out, these are the things that he has uh, and homebrewed. And I don't mean that to sound like it's a negative um, negative connotation for it because I know sometimes 
there are some out there that think, oh, if you're home brewing, you're you're breaking the rules. Uh, no, that's that's by design that uh, dungeon masters or game masters are going to home brew, brew blah, home brew what works best for their campaign. You know, works best for their setting. You know, I, I recently came across a question, a poll question. You know, uh, is uh, you know, should a game master ever exclude, you know, X, Y, or Z from their game, whether it be um, classes or species or races, whatever you want to call that, and, and whatnot, you know, and uh, homebrews in general or, or whatnot. And um, the simple answer is uh, yes to all. I mean, the game master should pick what he or she wants for their campaign, and, and that's the that's the rule. So really nice to see this. This is certainly something that um, Robert Connolly has obviously time tested, right? He's been playing with this system for 35 years. So um, if you want, you know, I, I would suggest picking this up. Uh, it is on drive through RPG. There are several supplements that go along with it, um, you know, although not required. You know, if you have this, you have the whole system. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I really do uh, recommend that you check this out if you can. And uh, I'm really looking forward to actually playing it uh, for the first time at uh, ShireCon coming up in uh, 2027. Uh, 20, what am I saying? 2027. On September 27th uh, and 28th. Of, uh, of this month. So uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, so thank you for joining. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, listen, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please take this opportunity now to, uh, you know, to click on down there on the subscribe, uh, hit the alert button so that you'll get the new, um, you'll get the alerts when new content is dropped on the channel. And, uh, and feel free to comment and uh, like it if you enjoyed it and um, but best of all you know comment in there let me know what you think about this this is a response to a recent comment on my channel asking me to do a deeper dive into this and uh, I have been really really trying to focus on those comments in the comments section and either adjusting or adding to what I'm covering on the channel based on your suggestions or your requests so uh, it's something that I have always tried to do the best that I can in keeping up with your questions and comments uh, but also I, I really do like presenting uh, on this channel a wide variety of game systems uh, from a number of different creators and, uh, and, and oftentimes bringing the creators onto the channel which I did have Robert Connolly on my channel talking about this game system, uh, which, which I will link to the uh, the end of this uh, of this video, so you'll be able to go and watch that interview as well. Uh, so, uh, as always, I really appreciate you stopping in. Enjoy the rest of your week. I look forward to seeing you on a gaming screen or at a convention table sometime soon, uh, possibly as early as you know two weeks from now. And uh, as always, keep on rolling those dice, keep on enjoying this hobby, and expand your horizons. If you're only playing one game system, look for something that uh, is either very, very different from what you're already doing, uh, whether it be running or playing, or look for something that will be an easy transition from you to go from the one to the other. Uh, so, you know, consider both, both possible options in there and very, very different includes different genres. If you're only playing a fantasy tabletop role playing game, you know, check out something that's science fiction or check out something that's horror or Western or, or just a look to expand your horizons. You will become more, um, more enamored, I'll say to this hobby if you try to experience everything that this hobby uh, has to offer. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks for joining. Have a great day.